Blue School's been around for about five years now. It started as a play group and it developed into kind of a preschool and now it's a bona fide school with a bona fide location that we're all very happy about. And it was one of those things where when we started working on it, we realized we had hit a nerve because people came out of the woodwork, other families, but teachers, educators in the field, neuroscientists, and they said, this is something that they've been thinking about and wanted to help us develop. Welcome to the next list. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Today you're gonna to meet three agents of change who are challenging traditional methods of teaching kids. They've begun an educational revolution, so to speak, certain that nurturing the human spirit is as essential as learning to read. These innovators open Blue School, where the emphasis is on collaboration, creativity, and the curiosity that leads to adventure. So what makes them experts in the art of learning? And how do they come up with the educational idea of a lifetime? As you'll see, the inspiration and the name, they didn't come out of the blue. kids are graduating into now is so uh, fast-paced and changing that they actually need to be students of innovation. They don't necessarily have to be artists, they don't necessarily have to be inventors, but everyone needs to know how to get up on that wave and ride it as opposed to be knocked over by it. Hi, I'm Phil. I'm Chris. I'm Matt, and we're three of the six co-founders of Blue School. You know, the world is clearly neither sustainable or harmonious at this point. And it's really going to take us and everyone uh, around today and the, the kids growing up into being the leaders of the world to change our course. I think to solve those problems, the problems we have today and in the future, it's going to take a, a level of creative thinking that maybe education hasn't done the best job at in the past. Innovation, we believe, is actually something that can be taught. It's something that can be nurtured. I think there are a number of reasons what brought us and the other three founders to starting Blue School. In some ways, it felt like it was a reaction to the culture and what was out there or what was not out there. Um, in another way, uh, we felt as if creativity and social emotional learning and collaboration wants to be folded into the education experience as much as any of the other academic subjects. I'm Molly, I'm a kindergarten teacher here at Blue School. This is one of the few places that I have seen, participated in, where children are at the heart of the learning. What you'll see is a class will decide that they want to talk about the weather. As kids of a certain age always do, they get fascinated by tornadoes. From tornadoes, you can go to so many areas. You can go to mathematics and, and other sciences. You can also go to geography. You learn that the only other place in the world where tornadoes take place besides the American Midwest is Mongolia. So this is how you use threads to get into a place that they're excited by and artfully weave in all the other disciplines. Blue School's been around for about five years now. It started as a play group and it developed into kind of a preschool and now it's a bona fide school with a bona fide location that we're all very happy about. And it was one of those things where when we started working on it, we realized we had hit a nerve because people came out of the woodwork, other families, but teachers, educators in the field, neuroscientists, and they said, this is something that they've been thinking about and wanted to help us develop. I'm Ken Robinson. I'm an educator, an author, and I'm on the advisory board of the Blue School. I met Matt and Phil and Chris through the TED conference. They saw the talk I gave in 2006 on creativity and, and contacted me. We arranged to meet for an hour uh, for lunch. 
and uh, the hour turned into eight hours. Uh, I cancelled the rest of the day because I thought they were great. <laughs> I just, I loved them. I, I just thought they were great. I loved what they were attempting at the school. I loved the way they were thinking about it. But I took an interest in it because I'm always interested to see schools who are trying to do something different. The good news for us is that we didn't have to invent this idea from scratch. There have been some incredibly innovative thinkers around the world working on these ideas, testing them. And so we were able to uh, reach out to those people, learn from them, uh, connect with them, and, and employ those ideas in day-to-day -day curriculum in the classroom. We had started a relationship with David Rockwell, uh, famed architect. After having done the Imagination Playground just two and a half blocks away, he had spent the last five, six years of his life studying how children play and learn. I think environment and space has everything to do with how kids perceive the world. While many playgrounds look different, right, and there's a lot of variety in how playgrounds look, the actual play value was quite similar. So. I started to research uh, the need kids have for their own child-directed play. We uh, started to realize there was this very interesting idea out there in the world that kids need to create their own world. They need to have risk. They need to have the opportunity for failure. They need to see what happens when they're creating something singular and they try and link it with the community. I didn't go to the Blue School thinking that I was going to end up being the architect for this project. I went there as someone who was interested to see what they were doing. Every part about it seemed spontaneous and wonderful, and the kids seemed great. It's thrilling to be a part of seeing it evolve. I hear all kinds of people say to me that they're not very creative. I think they're mistaken about it, and the reason is that they're naturally creative. It's like people are born with a natural power for languages. If you were born into a household that spoke five languages, you'd learn them all. But if you're born into a household where one language is spoken, you learn that one. And then you struggle a bit later on to learn a second language. So you have a capacity for it. Whether you realize it's a different matter. By the time most people, in my experience, get through their education, they start to think they're not very creative. And the reason is they haven't developed the abilities that go with it. The problem is that our current systems of education, systemically, they're rooted not in the 21st century, but in the 19th century. The way you improve education as a system is not to standardize it, but to customize it, but to personalize it. Because in the end, every kid has their own story. The kids and the teachers having a dialogue together about what they want to learn, and the kids feeling like they're owning some of this direction, but then the, the teachers artfully, deftly sewing into those subject matters all of the things that kids need to learn at the different ages to reach all the benchmarks, to satisfy all of the people out there that want to make sure that kids can read and do math and all that stuff. But you can get that in, nested within an adventure. For me, co-construction is all about trying to find all those pieces and fitting them together to be a community of learners. My first year at Blue School when I arrived, and I watched a child in my classroom create a catapult out of Legos and launch a little Lego across the room and watch the entire class turn to the child and go, oh, you made a catapult. That was my click. There was this child bringing a simple machine into the classroom. And from there, we launched a whole catapult unit where I had children age five talking about pivot points and fulcrums. That for me was that click when I said, this isn't just a theory, this isn't just a philosophy, this is what education should be. Why now has to do with things we know now that we didn't know. You know, there have been so many recent discoveries in the, uh, the area of neuroscience, and we know now that you can actually change your brain by the focus that you put on your brain, by learning how to think. You can actually learn divergent thinking. At Blue School, we feel like part of this worldwide movement that understands the importance of knowing how your brain works. So we intend to really take advantage of that new knowledge that's just you know, in the last couple of decades. Whether it's the school 
or the new material that we're putting in Las Vegas or these other uh, things that we're working on now where we can sort of just create these experiences outside of our theater. In every case, we're trying to establish something that e explodes with energy, that's the life force, has a playfulness to it, a lightness to it, a kind of celebratory effect, but it's also kind of showing that curiosity, that desire to learn. And finally, it's about that connection. And that's allowed us to do things that look a lot different than our work in the past, but still have that same DNA. Hi, I'm Chris. Matt. I'm Phil. And we're the founders of Blue Man Group. Over the past two decades, the Blue Man Group's exciting brand of unconventional theater has grown to span multiple cities and even stretch across the Atlantic. After 40,000 performances, finding ways to freshen the groundbreaking work might prove difficult for anyone else, but for founders Matt, Chris, and Phil, they're just getting started. Playing on concepts of communication, connection, and culture, they're building a brand new show for the Monte Carlo Resort in Las Vegas with all the trappings of Sin City's dazzling displays, Blue Man style. The first time we got into the character, bald and blue, black outfits, and started walking around, it started as a project for us, uh, kind of a weekend endeavor, um, kind of a social experiment. Uh, it was great to see people's reactions. I mean, that's what we were living off of. People would scream, they would ignore us, they would get angry. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we would get a free drink at a bar uh, just because it was novel. Keeping the show fresh has been always something that's been important to us because it's as if the Blue Man has come to not only our area but our time. And there's two dimensions of the show. There's one that's kind of ancient, primal, tribal, a little bit more timeless, and that's the stuff that doesn't change. But there's a whole other area, dimension, that's kind of topical pop culture, technology. And it's always been very important for that part to keep up with the time. So just as when we first opened, there was a piece on virtual reality, and then there was one on fractals. It, you know, now we have tablets. There's discourse about the interaction and the amount of time we spend with our digital accessories in and out of two-dimensional space and into three-dimensional space. And so we, we, we always have to keep that part fresh and up to date and, and have kind of also an element of the, the spectacle, the stagecraft, you know, keep up with what's available. We always like to go into a theater and kind of look at its size, its shape even sometimes, and, and uh, fit the material for those spaces. So within the U.S. you'll see a range of, of different material because of, the, because of the cities and the space they're in. We're spending a lot of time uh, in our workshops working on new material for the Vegas show when we move into the Monte Carlo in October. There's a lot of the technological elements that are going to the show that we have to work out here. And we've got robots and we've got a lot of new uh, digital multimedia elements that we're working on. Our interest in collaboration has reached a new level now because we've been able to reach out past our own company to some of the extraordinary designers and artists from around the world, such as Michael Curry, who's an extraordinary designer who worked uh, on the puppets on Lion King, numerous of Cirque du Soleil shows. I'm Michael Curry. We're here at Michael Curry Design, my studio, in Scapoose, Oregon. And we're workshopping with Blue Men, joining my specialty, which is scenic design, character design, puppetry and kinetics, with their work, which needs no explanation from me. I think when it came time for reimagining our Vegas show, we were going with such large-scale things and wanting to push out into some new areas. and actually enter into the casino and into Las Vegas beyond the theater walls. Once we were going to walk out of the theater, we knew we were walking into Michael's wheelhouse. Today we're working on the procession that's going to leave the Blue Man Theater in Las Vegas at the Monte Carlo and walk around the resort, maybe out on the strip even a little bit, and then come back into the theater. So it's very important that it's mobile, that it's energetic, that it's percussive, and feels like an organism. Processions have a 
have a beginning where you're seeing it coming and it's exciting and you barely and then when it's going beside you usually in profile there's a it's right on top of you as another layer and then when it leaves you you want to feel like you want to fall in behind it and you know it's a pied piper we're trying to make it an organism we're really thinking of it as a character the whole thing the whole stretch of the procession has a sentient being you know with a sort of a head and a tail unlike the new york show which is all about intimacy Vegas for us has always been about not just the, the ethos of the town, which is glitz and, and spectacle, but also just the size, the space, the space of the desert. And so we always look to create large scale work that takes advantage of that space. The blue men interacting with some robots on stage is a nice way for them to kind of take a look at how are we using technology and how is it using us. It's not really about this cold machinery, it's ultimately about you know, how can we use the robots to show something about the human spirit, really? We think the blue man can go into cultures abroad around the world and really collaborate and find ways to really get in and understand that culture and find what resonates to them. So that's part of our future that we really look forward to. The blue man is a sociologist. He's observing this culture. And that's why the blue man is not American and he's not African, he's not Asian. He's sort of, from wherever he's from, he's just a cultural observer. We've particularly connected with the audiences in Brazil, where over the last few years, we've had the opportunity of being exposed to huge parts of the population over there and be a part of their carnivals and just uh, working ourselves through their pop culture. We want to kind of establish ourselves as this creative collaborative entity and we hope that that cultural collaboration will begin there but grow to some other parts of the world because we, we feel like the blue man really is a character that should go in and understand, not only the way we've done here, understand, trying to understand our culture, but going into other cultures and, and really try to get into the zeitgeist of those cultures and, and collaborate and create something new. We're excited to see and experience the Blue School approach in other cultures because it's two-way responsive. We want to see how it works in other people's hands and we want to learn from that and have that come back to us and, and have it change here and morph and, and, and go back and forth. We're very much interested in, in that kind of an open dialogue with the, the rest of the educational world. And I think a key to Blue School is that we are all learners together and I think teachers forget that. I think they think they have to be the ones to deliver the answers all the time. And if we can really hone our understanding of being an inquirer along with our students, then we can bring a little bit of blue into every other school. They're passionate and they're practical and they're inspired. And that's the kind of energy that you want in a great school. They had the professional and other resources to at least make a start. I'm sure what they'll tell you is that when they started out, that they hadn't anticipated just how complicated and, um, and demanding the journey is. But the great thing about them is that their, their passion is completely undimmed, their enthusiasm grows by the day, and they're problem solvers. So each time they encounter the next problem, they engage with it and try and find a creative way to deal with it. One thing we've never done that I, I think we would like to do uh, is a theme park attraction that was outrageous and extraordinarily rich experience, Blue Man style. Another thing that we've never done, and probably for good reason, is a restaurant. The uh, Blue Man restaurant where the food is flying by you and you have to move your head quickly to eat it. I, I have know. a couple of recipes like that I've been working on at home with my four-year-old, by the way, but so far nothing is really um, stuck. I always like to go back to the, the four creative impulses that we've identified for ourselves and, and think of them as what it takes to live a really full human life. We want to express life force. We want to feel life force. We want to remain curious. We want to continue to explore no matter how old you are. We want to find collaborative relationships. We want to have relationships. And we want to be playful. And if you can find something that expresses all four of those at the same time, that's pretty good. I think the hope is that by having those creative impulses, 
the work can go far beyond the three of us. And it could be something that exists and lives and grows long after we're gone. From the first brilliant blue experiment on the streets of New York, to successful shows across the globe, to a school championing educational reform, Blue Man Group has found a way to consistently innovate by looking at the world as it is and realizing it as it could be, both through the eyes of their unique characters and the minds of young children. They are agents of change in every way, building upon the bedrock of their success and encouraging growth through humor and the art of play. For more on this episode and other agents of change, please go to CNN.com slash The Next List. You can also follow us on Twitter at CNN The Next List and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash The Next List. Also, don't forget to join me on my live stream at CNN.com slash Sanjay. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. See you next Sunday right here on The Next List.